I'll just look over here, detect. Yeah. A serial killer in Texas goes undetected for 11 years. Yeah, Police good. identify a suspect, but their case must be pulled from the trash. Investigators hope new forensic techniques can establish a link among the murders and put an end to the violent rampage. In California, a missing persons case leads detectives to a secret burial ground at a Sacramento boarding house. An unlikely suspect becomes the focus of a mass murder investigation. Can science help unmask the murderer hiding behind a kindly face? Homicide investigators find that things aren't always what they appear to be. Seemingly insignificant clues may expose a pattern and put police on the trail of a killer whose compulsion is to kill again. December 21st, 1984, in Wichita Falls, Texas, Lisa Boone returned home from her job at a local hospital and found herself locked out. Lisa asked her landlady to unlock the apartment. She'd given her keys to Terry Sims, a friend and co-worker who was spending the night. But Terry wasn't answering the door. Inside, the women found the apartment had been ransacked. Lisa called out to Terry, but got no response. Terry, I didn't hear. Hello, Terry. The landlady Terry? noticed blood on the floor and followed the trail. It led to Terry Sims' body. Officers from the Wichita Falls Police Department responded to the scene. Upstairs, they found the 20-year-old victim dead on the bathroom floor. She was nude, except for socks. Her hands had been tied behind her back. Police processed the scene, looking for any clue that might identify the killer. They collected blood samples, a pair of white tennis shoes with the laces still tied, and a woman's hospital uniform. They also recovered a blood-stained bedspread and sheets. At the police station, Lisa told detectives that she and Terry Sims left the hospital together after working the 3 to 11 shift. She explained that she was also a part-time student at Midwestern State University and had an exam the next day. Terry was going to stay the night at Lisa's apartment to help her study in the morning. But Lisa said the hospital was short-staffed that night, so she volunteered for an extra shift. She dropped her friend off at the apartment around 12.30, gave Terry her keys, and returned to work. When was the last time you saw her? Lisa told police she'd arrived back home around 7 a.m. and knocked on the door. She had no idea who could have murdered her friend. An autopsy was performed on Terry Sims, and cause of death was determined to be multiple stab wounds to the chest and back. While there was no sign of forcible rape, biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Excuse me, detective. Most murder victims know their killers. So Wichita Falls Police began interviewing Terry Sims' family and friends. Tony? They quickly focused on her ex-boyfriend. He denied involvement. 
investigators had little evidence against him, but they had a new forensic tool in their arsenal. In 1984, DNA profiling was in its infancy and held the potential to link a killer to his crime through biological evidence left at the scene. But large amounts of evidence were needed to successfully perform the tests. Hoping samples recovered in Terry Sims' case might identify her murderer, police submitted them to the Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. But their hopes were soon dashed. There wasn't enough material for DNA testing. With no hard evidence linking a suspect to the murder, the investigation stalled, and the case remained unsolved. On February 15, 1985, two months after Terry Sims was found murdered, an electric company employee was working on a transformer just outside the Wichita Falls city limits. He made a horrifying discovery he stumbled upon a woman's body. He called 911. Deputies from the Archer County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene. In the woods, they found the victim. Nearby, they recovered a leather jacket, blood-stained nurse's uniform, and a pair of sneakers with the laces still tied. A search of police databases turned up a missing person fitting the victim's description. An autopsy confirmed her identity as Tony Gibbs, a 23-year-old nurse from Wichita Falls, reported missing by her brother a month earlier. The pathologist determined that she died from stab wounds to the chest and abdomen. Biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Archer County investigators developed several suspects. They soon focused on a man named Danny Wayne Laughlin. He was the last person seen with Tony Gibbs. He had also been held on suspicion of rape in Kansas City, Missouri, less than a year before. Laughlin denied killing Tony Gibbs, but three separate polygraph tests suggested deception. At investigators' request, he provided blood and hair samples for DNA testing. Though the results were inconclusive, police believed they had the right man. Laughlin stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs. The jury was unable to reach a verdict. A mistrial was declared. Laughlin was yeah, never tried cool. again. The Gibbs case remained open. On October 10, 1985, a maintenance worker was cutting grass alongside a road in Wichita County. overgrowth, he discovered a woman's body. He called the Wichita County Sheriff's Department. When deputies responded, they found the body of a woman, nude except for one sock. There were no clues as to the victim's identity. Police searched the surrounding area and found her clothing nearby. They also recovered a pair of sneakers with the laces tied. An autopsy was performed, but advanced decomposition made it difficult to determine how the woman died. Based on available evidence, however, the medical examiner concluded the cause of death to be undetermined homicidal violence. Wichita County Sheriff's deputies determined that the victim fit the description of a woman reported missing a month earlier. 
She was identified as 21-year-old Ellen Blau. They interviewed two suspects who had been with her the night she was last seen. But deputies had insufficient evidence to charge them. After several months, the case remained unsolved. While the three cases were investigated by different law enforcement agencies, they all fell under the jurisdiction of the Wichita County District Attorney's Office. Barry Maka had recently been elected district attorney and took over just days after Terry Sims' murder. The unsolved murders haunted him. The absolute terror that they went through in the final minutes of their lives motivated me to find the person responsible for their deaths. Hello. But investigators in each of the cases had exhausted all their leads, and there was nothing more Maka could do. More than a decade would pass before there was a break in the unsolved murders. By 1996, more than 11 years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Texas. Police still had no viable suspects in any of the murders. But improved forensic procedures prompted the Wichita County District Attorney to request a re-examination of the evidence from two of the three murders. Some of the evidence was sent to Glenn Unash, a latent print examiner at the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab in Austin. He found a partial print on a sneaker recovered from the Terry Sims murder scene that had gone undetected. It didn't belong to Terry Sims. However, there was insufficient detail to make a comprehensive analysis. Because blood will darken as it absorbs the light, Unash hoped more ridge characteristics would emerge under laser light. He was disappointed. There was one more option, a dye staining technique. But there was a risk involved. The dye staining technique could possibly destroy what is there, so uh, the print was photographed prior to that. Once I got that photograph back, I examined it to make sure it re I recorded all the characteristics. Unash was now ready to try the dye staining process. He saturated the print with amino black, which reacts to proteins in blood and turns them dark blue or black. but the process didn't develop any further ridge detail. The evidence enhancement he had hoped for eluded him. Over the next three years, he examined a series of suspect prints provided by the Wichita County District Attorney's Office and compared them to the one found on Terry Sims' sneaker. I did not identify any of the suspects that they had sent me. I uh, reported to them that uh, the print appears to be partial second, third joint or another area of the palm. They started sending me in some palm prints. I made those comparisons. I still did not identify the print. At the same time, DNA testing of the biological samples from the Sims and Gibbs cases was again underway at Gene Screen in Dallas. A new technology, PCR analysis, could provide forensic scientist Judy Floyd with more conclusive results than previous tests. The requirements were not as stringent, and therefore we were able to use this very old, very degraded DNA and uh, obtain a genetic profile of the perpetrator. And the new DNA process eliminated all previous suspects, including Danny Wayne Laughlin, who had stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs a decade earlier. But it did turn up a startling piece of evidence. Biological samples recovered from both victims came from the same individual. Emerging technology and improved forensics had linked two apparently unrelated cases. Now there was evidence a serial killer had claimed the lives of Terry Sims and Tony Gibbs. 
District Attorney Barry Maka wondered if some of the other unsolved cases were related. He began taking a closer look at those files. One caught his attention, that of Ellen Blau. Maka noted that circumstances of her murder were similar to the Sims and Gibbs homicides. Down to the sneakers, laces still tied, found by her nude body. On January 12, 1999, Maka asked his investigator, John Little, to review the three cases and try to develop a suspect. He also gave Little a possible lead. Though the victims had been discovered in three different police jurisdictions, they all lived within a relatively small geographical area. Because of the close proximity, I felt that the person responsible for their deaths had some connection to that neighborhood. And so I emphasized that to John and asked him to review the files and, and see if he could establish anyone with a connection um, to the neighborhood that may be involved in, in the cases. Little began by probing for common threads among the women. It didn't take him long to find them. He noticed that they all shared several physical characteristics. All the victims were around the same age pretty much the same build. They're, they were all around five foot tall, not much taller. They all weighed 120 pounds or less. They all seemed to have pretty much the same features. A distinct pattern was emerging, suggesting all three women had been killed by the same person. Then he found a name in the Ellen Blau file, a man named Farian Wardrip. While in custody on a murder charge back in 1986, Wardrip had told police that he knew Blau. It meant nothing to the police at the time. Little wondered if it meant anything now. He learned Wardrip had worked as an orderly at the same hospital as Tony Gibbs. And records showed that he had left that job four days after the first victim Terry Sims was found murdered. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered more connections between Wardrip and the three women. He had lived in an apartment downstairs from Ellen Blau. That apartment was two blocks from the residence where Terry Sims was murdered. When Ellen Blau was murdered, Wardrip no longer lived at her apartment complex. He had moved to a residence across the street from the sub shop where she worked. Authorities had placed Wardrip in the neighborhood and established links between him and the victims. They were a long way from proving murder, but now they felt they were finally on the right track. A background check confirmed that Wardrip was a convicted murderer. He had confessed to killing a Wichita Falls woman in 1986. According to the records, he'd fled to Galveston, but turned himself in to police there. I mean, I think when he Sentenced to 35 years in prison, Wardrip had been paroled in 1997. During the 11 years he was incarcerated, there were no murders in Wichita Falls that were similar to those of Sims, Gibbs, or Blau and I felt like he was a very strong suspect. But the only way to find out for sure if he was the one responsible for these murders or not was to obtain a DNA sample. Although circumstantial evidence pointed to Wardrip, it wasn't enough to obtain a court order to force him to provide DNA samples. Maka and Little decided to try to collect them surreptitiously. Their plan would require surveillance. Investigators contacted Wardrip's parole officer for information. So where's he living? They learned that Wardrip lived in nearby Olney, Texas, where he taught Sunday school and worked at a window screen company. According to the parole officer, Wardrip was being electronically monitored 
and was restricted to his apartment complex unless he was at work or church. Appreciate it. Take care. Mm -hmm. And that posed problems for investigators. For three days, they watched Wardrip at work behind a locked chain link fence. He seemed to be beyond their reach. But on the fourth day, they got a break. On February 5th, 1999, the fence was unlocked and Wardrip was outside. He was with his wife, eating crackers and drinking coffee from a disposable cup. tossed the cup into a trash can just inside the gate. It was the opportunity they had been waiting for. The undercover investigator approached Wardrip and asked if he could get a tobacco spit cup. Wardrip told him to help himself. With that, any evidence obtained by investigators would be admissible in a court of law. He retrieved Wardrip's cup. Investigators hoped they now had their DNA sample. But would a few drops of coffee and cracker crumbs be enough to prove murder? More than a dozen years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Wichita Falls, Texas. Investigators had finally gathered physical evidence they hoped would prove Ferry and Wardrip was the killer. Now it was up to Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. Judy Floyd carefully swabbed the lip of the cup to collect Wardrip's saliva. When she compared that to DNA samples retrieved from the Sims and Gibbs murders, she was able to establish a match. And there was more. She discovered that Wardrip's profile was unique. He had not one, but four very rare markers in his genetic profile. His uh, profile was so rare that you would expect it to occur only one time in several thousand times the population of the Earth. And in effect, we were able to say that we have established identity with this particular individual to the evidence involved in Miss Sims and Miss Gibbs case. Investigators didn't stop there. At the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, Glenn Unash compared Wardrip's fingerprints to the partial print found on Terry Sims' sneaker. They matched. Besides making a positive identification, Unash could explain much more. I can also determine how that shoe was held or uh, when that print was left on that shoe. And it was in a uh, direction that the uh, defendant held the shoe or uh, was taking the shoe off the victim's foot, somewhat similar to this, which would be consistent with pulling it off of a victim's foot. Investigators' patience and ingenuity had paid off. It was time to take Wardrip into custody. They again enlisted the cooperation of his parole officer. On the pretense of a meeting, Wardrip was summoned to the parole office on February 13, 1999. When he arrived, police arrested Ferry and Wardrip and charged him with the murder of Terry Sims. Based on the evidence, police believe Wardrip saw Terry Sims at the door of Lisa Boone's apartment. After forcing his way inside, he tied her hands behind her back, then raped and killed her. Ferry and Wardrip pled guilty to the capital murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau. He was sentenced to death in the Sims case and received life terms in each of the others. Wardrip also confessed to an additional murder. 
In all, he had ended the lives of five young women. In Texas, a serial killer's guilt was contained in a disposable coffee cup. But on the West Coast, police would have to dig deeper for proof of murder. On November 7, 1988, in Sacramento, California, social worker Judy Moyes contacted Sacramento police about one of her clients, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. She said Bert had disappeared from the boarding house where she'd placed him. His landlady seemed unsure about his whereabouts. Ms. Moyes told police that Dorothea Puente's boarding house was a refuge for indigent people, many with histories of alcohol and drug abuse. It seemed ideal for Bert, a street person with no place to go. He had his own room and TV and was happy there after years of living on the streets. But after a few months, Bert started saying he wanted to leave. Judy Moyes hadn't heard from Bert in three months. Mrs. Puente finally explained that Bert had gone to live with his brother in Utah. That made no sense to Judy Moyes. She knew Bert Montoya didn't have any family. She asked police to look into it. Officers went to interview Dorothea Puente. She seemed a gracious, grandmotherly woman, charming and eager to cooperate. She said Bert had gone to live with family in Utah. One of the residents in the boarding house corroborated the account. I know who he is. But as the officer was leaving, the resident slipped him a note. He wanted to talk. He told police that he'd seen some strange things at the house. Bert wasn't the only one who vanished. Another time, Ben Fink had two, and there were others but their social security checks kept coming. He also described a terrible odor around the boarding house. He said he'd once worked at a mortuary and recognized the smell of death. Where, whereabouts are these holes? The police officer filed a missing persons report on Bert Montoya. Detective John Cabrera of the Sacramento Police Department was assigned the case. The name Dorothea Puente was familiar to him. She was known as a champion of the dispossessed. She was highly respected for all of her charitable things that she had done to the Hispanic community. Um, there were people that visited from other countries who came here to praise her and talk to her. And uh, she was known in the Hispanic community as Doctora, which is Spanish for doctor. Now, Detective Cabrera requested a background check on Dorothea Puente. Based on her reputation, it wasn't what he expected. He learned that the kindly grandmother was actually only 59 years old and had a criminal history of preying on the elderly. She'd been previously convicted on multiple counts of forging Social Security checks and had served four years in prison. For investigators, her M.O. was surprising. And she was getting these checks by putting knockout drops in these individuals' drinks. And of course, when they passed out, she took their check and signed it. Conditions of Dorothea Puente's parole prohibited her from keeping a boarding house. That gave detectives a reason to look deeper into the situation. Four days after Bert Montoya was reported missing, they met with Judy Moyes, hoping she could provide more information about the boarding house. She said most of the residents were poor, 
the forgotten elderly who exist on the fringes of society. But Dorothea Puente always had a place for them. And she had a reputation for treating tenants like family. Boys claimed that several other social workers began to notice that their clients sometimes disappeared from the house, never to be seen again. Bert Montoya was the most recent. Perhaps some of the tenants had simply wandered off, or family members had decided to take care of them. Investigators decided to find out. Later that morning, police met with Dorothea Puente. Although they didn't have a warrant, she graciously gave them permission to conduct a search. In one of the upstairs bedrooms, police found prescription medication, a sedative in the name of Dorothy Miller. She was related Mrs. To me Puente she told them it belonged to a relative who had stayed with her for a while. Investigators asked if they could dig around in her backyard. Mrs. Puente not only gave them permission, she offered to get people in to dig for them. That didn't seem the action of a person with something to hide. Investigators declined her offer and began digging themselves. After finding nothing in three holes, they began to think they were wasting their time. But in the fourth, they found corrosive lime, often used to mask odors and speed decay. They decided to keep digging. To their surprise, they uncovered what appeared to be a human leg bone. At a boarding house for the elderly run by 59-year-old Dorothea Puente, Sacramento police uncovered human remains. We need to get uh, forensics here. Yeah. The coroner's office and a crime scene unit were dispatched to the scene. Puente agreed to accompany police to the station to make a statement. She was very cooperative and appeared genuinely shocked that bones were found in her yard. She said she had been living there for little more than a year. Perhaps the previous owner could explain the bones. But Puente's criminal past could not be ignored. Police asked her outright if she'd killed her missing tenant, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. Dorothea Puente calmly denied it. Since there was no evidence of any crime, investigators took Mrs. Puente home. The next morning, the search at the boarding house continued. As more police and excavation equipment arrived, curious onlookers and reporters began to assemble outside the house. Around 9.45, Mrs. Puente asked if she was free to go to the corner coffee shop. Since she'd been so cooperative and detectives had no proof of her involvement in any foul play, they let her go. Fifteen minutes later, at 10 a.m., forensic technicians uncovered a second body, wrapped in a tarp, buried under a cement slab. The condition of the tarp indicated that this body hadn't been underground very long. A police officer was dispatched to pick up Dorothy Puente at the coffee shop. She wasn't there. We sent people over there to find out who had seen her, if anybody had talked to her, uh, what was going on. They went over there and they had ascertained that she had uh, got into a taxi cab and drove off. Sacramento police traced the cab and learned it had taken her to the Stockton bus station, 50 miles away. There, they learned she boarded a bus to Los Angeles. Not knowing where she might be heading, investigators launched a nationwide search for Dorothea Puente. 
She was now wanted on suspicion of murder. At the boarding house, authorities continued digging. Their search for missing person Bert Montoya had unearthed human remains of one victim and a second buried corpse. Mindful of statements that several residents had disappeared, police feared Mrs. Puente's yard might conceal more ugly secrets. The second body had been discovered under a cement slab that seemed out of place. Now they realized that several more sheds, slabs, and planters were oddly situated. They soon discovered the reason for that. Laura Santos, deputy coroner of Sacramento County, supervised the search. Under every one of these odd seeming things like the sink, there was a body. Under the poorly poured piece of concrete, there was a body. Next to the shed that looked hastily assembled, there was a body. After three days, the dig finally came to an end. Seven bodies had been uncovered in Dorothy Puente's yard. Police were dealing with a mass murderer. It seemed impossible that seven people could have been buried right under the neighbors' noses without anyone seeing anything. Hoping for information or witnesses, detectives began interviewing Mrs. Puente's neighbors. It was hard to find anyone with anything negative to say about her. It was like fighting an uphill battle. The community, first of all, did not want to accept the fact that this gray-haired little woman who they loved so much and who had given so much to the community was responsible for this gruesome task of uh, putting these people in the yard. While investigators canvassed the neighborhood, the grim task of identifying the seven victims, three men and four women, was underway at the Sacramento coroner's office. All the bodies were x-rayed, then forensic pathologists performed autopsies on them. The coroner started with the victim most closely matching Bert Montoya's description. She began by carefully removing layers of wrapping and documenting each. The body, like many of the others, was wrapped in a signature way that suggested a methodical but twisted mind. Sheets wrapped with duct tape, then quilts stitched together, blankets, then more sheets, more um, tarps. I remember there were blue tarps on a couple of the cases. And then each layer would somehow be secured, either with twine or duct tape or actually stitched with thread. And then the entire bundle, perhaps, duct taped together. The wrappings concealed advanced decomposition, which made it impossible to establish a cause of death for any of the victims. But because of the circumstances, all were ruled homicide. The condition of the bodies also prevented pathologists from immediately identifying any of the victims. As Dr. Santos explains. Most people are identified by fingerprints first, next by dental records, and then by other means. Four out of the seven bodies were too decomposed to get decent fingerprints from. None of them had any teeth. So the usual methods that we make an identification could not be used. The tissue samples were sent to forensic labs for further analysis. To aid in identification efforts, investigators tried to locate people who had disappeared from the boarding house. They found the brother of 55-year-old Ben Fink, one of the tenants believed to be missing. But he told police he hadn't heard from Ben in three months. Investigators feared Ben Fink had already been found. To build their murder case against 59-year-old Dorothy Puente, police needed physical proof linking her to the victim's deaths. Investigators went through the boarding house again. 
they found twine, duct tape, and a coffee can with the word lie written on it. Police found dozens of bottles of the prescribed sedative Dalmain. That didn't seem unusual in a boarding house full of elderly people. But investigators noticed all of the Dalmain, although prescribed by several different doctors, was in Dorothea Puente's name. As details of the investigation became public, police began hearing from witnesses who helped them reconstruct an account of Dorothy Puente's daily routine. It seemed she had a penchant for pre-dawn gardening and became very angry if interrupted. They also learned that she insisted on personally collecting the mail every day, particularly at the end of the month. She was always there to get the mail because, of course, the mail had the checks. And um, she would take the checks and keep control of all the money. Investigators learned that nobody had questioned that control. Since most of the boarding house residents had drug or alcohol problems, it seemed a logical way to keep them from lapsing into their old habits. Police believed that by persuading residents to sign their monthly checks over to her, Mrs. Puente would be assured that the money would keep coming even after the tenants disappeared. In fact, she was getting 10 to 12 federal assistance checks each month, some for people who hadn't lived at the boarding house in years. Thanks. Police believed that, uh, money was the motive for murder, but they still needed to find their suspect. Despite the manhunt, Dorothea Puente was still at large. On November 16th, less than a week after she fled, investigators got a tip that Dorothea Puente was at a motel in Los Angeles. An elderly man called police when he saw her picture on TV. He'd recognized her as the woman who'd struck up a conversation about his social security benefits. She wanted to know things like, you know, how much he was getting and was he taking you know, a uh, benefit, full benefit of receiving the money. And of course, you know, he was inquisitive, but she had told him that she knew how to raise his money allotment. Even as a fugitive, she couldn't resist the opportunity to cash in. Her greed had finally caught up with her. Dorothy Puente was finally in custody. Though they believed they knew her motive for the murders, police had no physical evidence linking her to them. In addition, the victim's identities were still unknown. A latent print examiner was brought in. He compared known samples to fingerprints from three of the bodies. He confirmed that one of the victims was Bert Montoya. He would soon identify Ben Fink and Dorothy Miller as well. Science had made a liar of Dorothea Puente. But there remained four victims without names. Police had compiled a list of 60 people who had received Social Security checks at Dorothea Puente's boarding house. They tried to track down every name on that list. They found most of the people still alive having moved out of the house for a variety of reasons. But a few were still unaccounted for. They then assembled medical records on each missing person. The files were forwarded to the Sacramento coroner's office. There, forensic pathologists began the painstaking task of comparing x-rays of each body found in the yard to medical records from each of the missing persons. They looked for distinguishing characteristics in the records that could be linked to each victim. We did find anomalies in the bodies, abnormalities, like one person had had skull surgery and had evidence that he'd had a craniotomy. 
and another person had irregular characteristics of one of her clavicles and she'd also had some mandible lower jaw fractures in the past. And using that information from the bodies, we were then able to start making comparisons with the medical records we'd obtained from this list that Social Security had provided us. The victims had all finally been identified. But police were still missing a crucial piece of the puzzle, how they died. Until that question could be answered, authorities would have a hard time proving murder. They hoped a forensic toxicologist could give them answers. In November of 1988, police investigating the murders of seven people at a Sacramento boarding house enlisted the aid of toxicologist William Phillips at the California Department of Justice. With no obvious cause of death, they hoped he would be able to determine whether drugs or poisons had ended the victims' lives. Phillips began by analyzing all seven victims' tissue samples with a radioamino acid, or RIA, test, which is sensitive to classes of drugs. The test results showed all of the samples contained the sedative flurazepam, which is used widely in Dalmain, the drug found at Dorothea Puente's boarding house. It is a potent sedative often prescribed for the elderly. It was the first physical evidence linking Puente to the deaths of the seven victims. Next, Phillips subjected the samples to the tandem mass spectrometer, the only one on the west coast at the time. The apparatus uses negative ion detection to find the characteristic profile or footprint of individual drugs. Besides detecting the presence of fluorazepam or dalmain in each sample, it also measured the drug's concentration. But because the bodies had been underground for varying periods of time, those concentrations did not necessarily reflect levels present at the time of death. Some of the drug could have seeped into the ground. The drug Dalmain was present in all the samples, but the concentrations were so varied that no one could say whether or not the drug caused their death. But I was able to link all the samples all the tissues, the brains, the liver tissues from all these victims to Dorothea Puente. Investigators believed they had enough evidence to charge Dorothea Puente with the murder of her seven tenants. Based on the evidence, police believe she would charm residents into giving her control of their money. If they were reluctant, she would invite them into her private rooms and give them a drink laced with drugs. Afterwards, she would methodically wrap the bodies and hire men to dig holes in her backyard. During her pre-dawn gardening, the 59-year-old woman managed to bury her victims. On August 15, 1993, Dorothea Puente was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. The jury was unable to reach verdicts on the other four charges. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Serial killers are methodical skilled at covering their tracks in order to keep killing. But even the cleverest of predators cannot avoid detection for long. Today, forensic scientists using sophisticated technology are helping police stop deadly criminals with an urge to kill again.